Now it's time to talk about digital signatures. In the physical world, we have signatures. Uh, for example, a person has a certain signature to sign stuff with. And in the digital realm, you don't have persons, but you have private keys that can produce digital signatures for a certain message. I will show you first an, uh, an overall picture of the, of the uh, digital signature process. This is a bit busy diagram, but, but I will, I will uh, sort it out for you. You can just focus on the numbers here. Number one here, number two here, and number three here. So these are three separate processes of, of the for digital signatures. So step one is, is to create something called a key pair, uh, which consists of a private key and a public key. And the private key can be, is usually a huge random number and the public key is derived from that private key. And then you distribute this public key to, to, to people. And in this example, you have you yourself and you have Fred. Fred, Fred is on your right. And you want to send a cat picture to Fred, but you also want to, Fred also wants to make sure that this cat picture hasn't been tampered with during transit. So he wants to make sure that it's the same cat picture that, that, uh, that you actually intended to send to him. There can be some hackers in the middle wanting to destroy your cat picture or change it in vicious ways. Okay, so let's go back to number one here. You, you create your uh, key pair, which are two big numbers, and you move the public, you, you give the public key to Fred, you meet in person, and you give the public key to Fred, which is a big number, and then Fred knows that this big number, this public key belongs to you. So he knows that it's yours because he has got it, he got it from you in, in uh, he got it from you in, in person. So that's the first step. Now you have created your key pair and uh, distributed your public key. The next step is actual signing. So when you want to send the cat picture to Fred, you create a message, an email, where it says, hi, Fred, here's the cat picture I promised you. Here's my digital, digital signature for it. And then you attach the cat as an attachment to, uh, to the email. And then you sign the cat with your private key. So digital, a digital signature needs two inputs. It needs a message which is the cat in this case, and a private key, which you just created through your random number generator. And the result is a, a digital signature that you put in your email like this. And this digital signature is a big, big number as well. Uh, actually, it's, I think it's two big numbers, but, but you can just view it as a, one big piece of one piece of data. Okay, so you send this email to Fred and Fred will read this me message. He will extract the cat picture from the attachment and store it on his hard drive, store it on his hard drive. And he will extract the signature from the email and use the, the cat as message. And the signature and the public key, three inputs to verify this signature. And if the cat hasn't changed, uh, the signature verifies and he can be sure that the cat picture hasn't changed during transit. So this is really useful for, yeah, for integrity shakes. We will go through these steps a bit uh, uh, deeper, but we will also look at this uh, from the cookie token context. 
So this is a very gener generic example. So in the cookie token co context, um, Lisa will require everyone who wants to pay money uh, to provide their signature because she she doesn't want she, she, she can't remember everyone's face anymore. So a typical a typical message to Lisa will look like this. <clears throat> Lisa, please move 10 cookie tokens to, to cafe slash John. And also uh, the email includes a digital signature like this. And this slash John is important because Lisa needs to know who this message is claiming to be from. So this message claims to be from John. She can't be sure about it, but it claims to be from John, which is important. Right now it's important at least. And uh, this, is the, this is the full uh, uh, cookie token example where you have the three same three steps. You have step one up here, step two, step three. So generate the key pair, sign and verify. So we will go through this. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna. Yeah, so, uh, so John will, will create his key pair and give the public key to Lisa. And Lisa will store this public key under John's name. So John says, hi, I'm John. This is my private key. Uh, this is my public key, sorry. And Lisa will store this in a, spe uh, in a special table that she created where she keeps track of everyone's public key. So she, keep, she, she notes down John's public key here. So this is step one. And this, this private key is created from a random number generated typically. And then he also stores this random number, the private key on his own hard drive. So he can remember it for the future. And Lisa now remembers his public key for the future. And I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between private and public keys, because this is very important. What you encrypt with, the, if you start on the left side here, what you encrypt with a public key can only be decrypted with a private key. So you encrypt with a private public key and the only way to decrypt this blob here is to decrypt it with a private key. And it also works the other way around. If you look at the right side, what you encrypt with a private key can only be decrypted with a public key. So in, uh, in Bitcoin and in cookie tokens, we only, we only use the right side of this diagram. The left side is used for secret communication where you, want, where you want to make sure that no one can understand what you're saying to the other person, except the person it's intended for. So that's, that's encryption. So this is, used, this is used for encryption. And the right side is used for digital signatures but it's using the same kind of concept that you, you encrypt with one of the keys and you decrypt with the other key. So from now on, we can forget about the left side and only focus on the, only focus on the right side of this diagram where you encrypt with a private key and decrypt with a public key. And as I've said before, uh, the public key can be derived is derived from the private key through a one-way function, which is some fancy math. But it's very important that this, fun that this function is one-way uh, because you don't want to be able to get the private key from a public key. The private key is private, the public key is public. So let's go to the second step of this pro process, signing a payment. So you have this uh, email to Lisa, you want to send 10 cookie, or John wants to send 10 cookie tokens to the cafe. And so he writes, Lisa, please move 10 cookie tokens to cafe, slash John. 
Okay, so this is, so, so John takes this message and he runs it through a cryptographic hash functions, function, function to get a, a hash, which is 256 bits. And then he will encrypt this hash with the John's private key to get the signature, which he then puts in the email. You might be wondering why does he need to hash the message before he encrypts it? He could, he could also just encrypt the message itself and put the, the, the encrypted version of the message in the signature, as the signature. But, but that wouldn't be good if the, if, the, if the message is big, you will also get a very big signature. So you want a fixed size signature. So that's why you first hash it to get a fixed size hash that you encrypt. Okay. So, um, so this is how John signs his payment. He hashes the message and encrypts the hash and puts that hash in the signature as the signature. And then let's look at how Lisa then would verify this payment. Because Lisa has now removed, the, Lisa has now received this message from John or supposedly from John, because it says here slash John, Lisa thinks, okay, this might be from John. It claims to be from John. And she wants to do two things. First, she, uh, she wants to make sure that uh, this signature is okay, uh, to make sure that this is actually from John. And then she will, sh then she needs to verify that John has the money to spend before she adds the, the payment to the, to the spreadsheet. Okay, so let's look at this. We have A, B, C here. So Lisa takes the message and she has, hashes it to get a hash. And this, this hash should, if everything is correct, this hash should match this hash right here, because it's the hash of the same message. So, and that's what she wants to verify right now. So she takes this hash, uh, she, yeah, she, she makes this hash and she also decrypts the signature with John's public key. She, because this message, message claims to be from John. So she, she looks up John in her table of public keys and take that public key to use for decryption of the signature. And if you go back yet again, if you take the signature and go backwards and decrypt it, you should get the same hash. So she will now compare these two hashes. And if they are uh, the same, She's, she can be certain that this is actually from John because only John has the private key that's required to create this signature. So that's how you would verify uh, uh, a message to Lisa. So now Lisa can, can uh, check for John's balance and if he has the money to spend, she, she can add a new, uh, she can add a new row in the spreadsheet. Yeah, so to summarize, a digital signature consists of three processes. The first is where you create your key pair and distribute the public key. That's a preparation phase. And then you have the signing phase where you have, where you have a message and a private key as input and the output is a signature. And then you have the verification phase on your right, where you have the public key, the message, and the signature as input. And the output will be true, false, okay or not okay, correct or, or, or not correct. Yeah, so this is just the same picture as I showed before. I don't know where, why I put it here, but yeah. So 
this is now the, the, the full process that Lisa is using. And I think we will pause here for exercises. And, but first, if you have, if you have any questions right now, you can, you can ask them. Yeah, someone asks, uh, Kali, could you please explain pre-image resistance and second pre-image resistance again? I'll try. Yeah, so you want to understand the pre-image resistance and second pre-image resistance. Yeah, the, the difference there. So uh, in, the, in the middle picture here on the pre-image resistance, suppose that you are an attacker and you see this hash here. Then your problem is to find an input that corresponds to this hash. Find an input that, that, uh, that will generate this hash. If you don't know any such input, you, you have to guess. So you have to guess over and over for different inputs. Maybe the word hello, or maybe the word one, two, three, or uh, uh, your entire music collection. You will try different inputs to this SHA-256 uh, algorithm. And for each input, you will, you will get, get a, a certain output. And that will most likely not be the output you are looking for, because this is a 256 bit number, which is a huge number. And for every input, you will get another number uh, until you guess the co exact correct input. Only then will you see this uh, uh, correct output. So, so this is the simplest case, so to speak. This is the most easy to grasp. It's hard to, to it's hard. You can't run this function backwards, so to speak. But there is a variant of this, which is called second pre-image resistance, which is, you know, one input, you, you know, a pre-image. I'm sorry, I may, maybe I didn't even say what pre-image means. Pre-image means basically an input for a hash, the input corresponding to a hash. So suppose you know a pre-image, hello, then your uh, your task as an as an, ex, uh, as an attacker is to find another pre-image that will give you the exact same hash. So that's a slightly different problem than the, the than the pre-image resistance problem, but they are very related. So uh, that that's the that's the major difference. I I hope that was okay.